Okay, let's do a quick sound check and we'll get started. Test one, two, three, four. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 22nd, 2022. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time to be here and also finding the show. If you want to watch this show live and participate live, it's the only live show that I'm currently doing at this particular time. Go to DaveLander.com slash webinar. Register even if the link is old or the date is old, which it will likely be because I often forget to update it. And you'll have access to live, live shows for the next six months and hopefully next six years, as long as I remember to add shows. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks and your crypto i don't know why i have crypto in there twice uh, crypto's warming up a little bit in some areas we'll take a look at that in one second this week i'm on a bit of a schedule so i want to kind of keep it a little more brief than normal uh, obviously i'll take time for your questions and stock picks but uh, as far as a presentation uh, phase i want to talk about market timing especially with everything going on and update and basically a lot of things we've been talking about lately when it comes to market timing. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you lose money trading, or as I'll just sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, quick update on the VIX. It's just one thing I wanted to show you real quick, actually a couple of things, but one thing in particular, as I said years ago, I work with Connors doing some uh, programming and also some, oops, the programming and research for him. And he taught me about the VIX and how the VIX worked. And one thing that was interesting is in his first book he did, he talked about buying and selling when the VIX was above and below 15. But that no longer worked. And what happened was the VIX had, had gotten well above 15 and it never looked back for a long time. And he explained to me how it reverts to the mean. So a lot of the stuff that I focused on was just that, reverting to the mean. And that's where the CBR3 and CBR3 Plus and whatever other systems are out there on the VIX. But like I've been saying, when you're dealing with a short-term system, it could be quite wonderful and quite amazing. However, because your gains are limited to only that short period of time, and your losses are somewhat unlimited because even though a market doesn't seem to move in your favor over a short period of time, it certainly can move against you <laughs> quite a bit. So when I dusted off all my VIX stuff a while back, I was pretty impressed with the performance until I got to the pandemic and, and it all kind of blew up a little bit there. And it probably worked great coming into the pandemic. But anyway, Getting back to the reversion to the mean, the when you have a moving average in place, it helps to kind of get you to the new normal. So the, the high 20s is now sort of the new normal. And a lot of my systems are based on the market reverting back to its mean after it stretched 10% or more. Now, the VIX stuff I've been doing in more recent times is focused on the intraday chart so you're getting in at one point during the day and hopefully getting out much higher or lower depending on, on what you're doing either in the overall market or or and or the inverted vix or the the up vix or the down vix uvxy or svxy as i preach don't hold those things longer term they're they're very complex derivatives it's a derivative of a derivative of a derivative of a derivative, I think. Futures and then all this other stuff. It gets really complex really fast. And a lot of people often, and, and I've seen it quite a bit too. Larry, Larry McMillan has pointed it out to me, but I've actually seen it personally in more recent times. A lot of people just get the VIX wrong. It's, it's a lot more complex, but you don't, then, then they think it is. But you don't have to fully understand what it is or the formula that creates it. It's just a hypothetical options, puts and calls at the money over a certain period of time. It's it's um, 
I want to use the word manufactured, it's created. And anyway, the thing is, just know that if it gets stretched to the upside, there's a bit of a panic in the markets and the implied volatility rises. So it's, it's measuring a hypothetical implied volatility. And when it gets stretched to the downside, the market has become complacent. So it reverts back and forth to the mean. And I didn't mean to go into all this tonight, but another thing I often see, which kind of makes me a little batty, is people point out cup and handles and some other patterns or whatever in the VIX. And it, that's not what you're measuring. You're measuring volatility, which is a completely different animal and actually totally different than, let's say, a stock or an index or, or things of that nature. Anyway, so the one thing I want to show you tonight is we've normalized because the market has begun to sell off again. This is S&P in the background. And in the middle, I've got the close. And since I'm doing the intraday stuff, I thought the open and the high would be kind of interesting for this type of analysis. Now, I'm pretty new, I guess, to the intraday stuff here. I guess we've been talking about it for six months or longer, but fairly new compared to a lot of other stuff that I've been doing, such as the trend following more on stuff for the last 20 something years. So it's still a work in progress, but I do think there's something there, especially if it gets really stretched one way or the other. And one thing I was talking about recently too, and here I go, I'm going to cover everything, <laughs> is the, the asymmetry or the asymmetrical possible move is, is to the upside. So if you see this, this indicator down here, we're looking at what's the percentage move based on its recent range. And you can see this 200% move in the VIX, meaning that this wide range bar is much wider than anything going back 10 days or so, is to the upside. Now, it does implode sometimes, but not nearly as spectacularly, if that's a word, as it does to the upside. But anyway, in the middle, high, open, and close. And 10% is a good round number. Anything above 10% the VIX tends to revert back to its mean. Anything below 10%, the VIX tends to revert back to its mean. But it can stretch away for a while. So you'd have to wait for some sort of signal, some sort of that signal that that reversion to the mean has begun. And also maybe if you're watching the index or whatever, maybe wait for some sort of signal that the index has begun to turn. And as you know, lately, it seems like we've been getting oversold, 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 and we're just not getting a meaningful bounce in the markets. Anyway, that's a lot more than I wanted to say about the VIX, but we are somewhat stretched right now. Keep an eye on, out on that. If we tumble a little bit further and get even super duper oversold, which I'll talk about in a few minutes when we get to the, some of these market indices, but especially the S&P 500. But if we get super duper oversold and that thing gets kind of really stretched to the outside, we could see an implosion in the VIX and then followed by the mother of all relief rallies. Now. Don't rush out and try to trade just because we're due for that. Maybe I should follow my own advice. <laughs> I don't have anything great to show you this week as far as our live trades. But I think that we're due and I think the clock is ticking and we need to pay attention to what's happening there. All right, I do want to follow up on the TFM 10% system. Any questions on the VIX or anything like that before we go much further, before we go any further? Okay, I'll just keep going then. So where are we now as far as the market timing? And I want to talk about avoiding bad things. And like now, question mark, but I guess we could take the question mark out. So things aren't fantastic. So just real quick, I know we've been going through this kind of ad nauseum, but the buy line is 10% below the 50-week closing high. So subtract 10% from the 50-week closing high. And that's the buy line. My theory is if a market's going to drop 50%, it's going to drop 10% first. And that's just technical analysis 101. If you can wrap your head around that, then you, then you have what it takes to become a technical analyst. So here's the parameters here. So it's 90% of the 50-week closing high. So 90-50 would be the 90% line, if you want to call it that, or 10% below the 50 week closing high. Sell signal is simply a close below the buy line, meaning that the market has now sold off more than 10% and closed more than 10%. This is a weekly chart. Closed more than 10% below 
where it was previously, looking back 50 weeks at the 50 week closing high, and it's also below the 50 week moving average. As I've been saying quite a bit, we did have a little whipsaw signal that I didn't even notice in between because the market had already turned around by the time it triggered the signal. And you have to have two bars of upside Landry light. And maybe if I made this moving average a little thinner, you could see there is a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of a, of a gap, so to speak, with the Landry light, which we'll talk about in one second, above the moving average. But as I've been saying, and Najem, the fact that it sold off so hard, and the fact that I just plain old didn't see the Landry light, but the fact that it sold off so hard, as a trend follower, I like to buy on strength and sell on weakness. So in that particular case, technically it was a buy. And we'll look at the chart, uh, the spreadsheet that is, in just a few minutes. And if you did go long on that, then it's okay, okay? It's okay to lose a little money. It's not okay to lose a lot of money. And like Greg Moore says, and I say often quoting him, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating, you can survive frustration. Anyway, we did have a repeat sell signal, so you did lose a little money should you have bought on that. I would recommend you not buy on weakness. You might want to write that down. If you're a trend follower, you want to always be buying on strength and you want to always be buying the market as it's moving higher. That in and of itself will keep you out of a lot of trouble. As I think I said in my stock chart show recently, trading is really, it's not these huge epiphanies, it's just little things you kind of chip away at. And one thing that uh, I did recently, and I try to be cognizant of and not get too caught up in the markets, is try to always enter on a stop entry market, especially if I'm trading intraday, but stop entry market entry orders can can be a wonderful thing. If you're position trading, you put them in, forget about them, go about your life, you get triggered in, you get triggered in. Back when I left the office a little more than I do now, now that I have two presentations I'm doing every week, plus projects and international work seems to be surfacing once again. I'm really, really, really busy, so I'm always here anyway, and that's why I'm firing off some of these intraday trades and paying attention to the intraday VIX and things like that. But anyway, something like buying on strength and using an entry order and then the other thing i wanted to kind of touch upon too is your you will have some big epiphanies maybe longer term something will pop up and you're like oh that's a great i, I get it you know maybe I, I can do this thing but the a lot of what you do will be like little small things like you know what if i just put in a stop order as anxious as i am to jump in this market let me just put a stop order a little bit above the market. And of course, you, could, you you will occasionally buy the high tech, but you're going to be shocked at how many times you're going to miss getting in when the market just reverses and implodes and save yourself a lot of money. It's kind of hard to quantify the, a negative like that, but if you make a mental note or even better, write in your trading journal and say, hey, look, I missed this because I was waiting for that entry. And the the little things is... The, the Kaizen approach. Kaizen approach is, is just taking little tiny things and making them better. And it, it, it's better off if you do take a Kaizen approach, by the way. If you want to make a big change in your life, make a small change. And that's, I think it's how a small change can change your life is the, the Kaizen way. And it's a pretty good little book. It's a quick read. And I forget the, Robert Marr, I think. I, I met him once at a conference and uh, he was a pretty cool guy. Anyway, so we're under a cell. And one thing that I've been talking about a lot is where bad things happen, and that's Vallejo and Gaed. And the other way I look at it, too, is good things can happen, or mostly good things can happen, as long as you're above the byline. Their original research was based on, I believe, moving averages, such as the 200-day moving average, and bad things happen below the 200-day moving average. But we could flip that on its head and say, well, good things happen when the market is above the buy line and above the 50 week simple moving average, or as I'll kind of beat the dead horse on throughout this presentation, other presentations, when it's above just a daily 30 EMA, especially if you've got Landry light. But again, you can see we're back to where bad things happen. And just, Going through this quickly, this is from last week. You can see lots of bad things happen 
and bad things could happen. And even if you do get whipsawed, some of those whipsaws are pretty big moves. And as I've said, ad nauseum, 2015, 2016 was absolute horrible time to trade. And even though the market went back up, it was it was pretty ugly during those periods. We had a little spill in 2019, you probably remember. And of course, the pandemic. And even though it snapped right back, as I've said before, there was a 28% diaper change moment. And that's a pretty substantial thing. And it was definitely one of those times where it's better to be on the dock wishing you were out of the sea than out of the sea wishing you were on the dock. Well, we're back to that red phase again, obviously. And you can see what happens when you get a pretty nasty spill down here. This is how far the market has fallen on a 50 week basis. So you take the 50 week closing high and you can see these drawdowns are very substantial. Now, just real quick, obviously if you took the last trade, it would have been a whipsaw, you would have lost 5%. And then getting out, the diaper change would have been minus 13% so far. And I think I have a chart on that. And you can see bear markets throughout history and 20 and 18 and 40 something percent moves. And then if you go way back, there's like a 83 or 90 percent move. I forget which, I think 83 back during the depression, obviously. So the diaper change, just real quick, is how far the market drops after you sell. I know a lot of people here or everybody here probably tonight knows all these things. But number one, it doesn't hurt to rehear them. And number two, I will get asked a lot of questions on this. Anytime you present a system, you get a lot of questions. So that's a 13 percent move. Avoid it. And 13%, I mean, I was doing little math, you know, 100K account, that's 13K, a million dollar account, that's $130,000 that you didn't have to watch evaporate, okay? So anything, if we get below that 13% level, in other words, we start closing at new lows, or even dropping below those new lows, obviously the diaper change is gonna go past 13. So with 13% and counting, so to speak, let's hope it doesn't get worse, but better to be on the dock, hoping it doesn't get worse than out to sea, <laughs> hoping it doesn't get work, right? Worse. Anyway, as I've been saying quite a bit too, the other thing is that this is based on 50 weeks, again, the byline. So you're looking back in time, 50 weeks, so until we hit 50 weeks, this buy line is not going to start coming down. Even though it does have a lot of lag in it, sometimes lag is okay, and sometimes lag is okay with a moving average too. So you see how this moving average just kind of gradually rolls over, then gradually turns up, and gradually catches up with price. Well, that helps to ride out, especially a longer-term trend following system like this, a lot of whipsaw. So yeah, this thing went straight back up, but notice that it didn't get above the buy line, it didn't get above the 50-week moving average, and then it rolled back over. So sometimes lag is okay. A lot of people try to get the lag out when they're designing systems, and you got to be careful with that because you end up curve fitting, and also you'll end up chasing your own tail a lot of times if you're not super careful with that. So I know we talked about these things quite a bit. Just want to highlight a couple things. As I said, at nauseum last summer, I decided, hey, I'm going to do a presentation while the market's making all-time highs on the importance of market timing. So my friends and relatives don't call me now. Well, guess what? They're calling me now. <laughs> so, and then it's all—it's like over the weekend, some friends were kind enough to take us to Saints game, and it's—it's it's, it's always the same thing. It's like. Uh, I try to explain all oh, the market going up, market going down. I show them my arm where that where I have the instructions printed, and et cetera. And they're like, well, it's low now, so we should buy more. I'm like, oh, geez, no, you don't hear me. <laughs> but I would encourage you, not you people, but I would encourage you people to tell your people when they get confused, just go in and show them before the bomb blows up type presentations that I've done in the past. One was August 25th or something last year. And explain to them that sometimes it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. That's one of my favorite sayings. And just realize, again, all asset classes will lose at least 50% of their value at some point in your lifetime. 
and as I would say quite a bit, the 30 EMA can be your best friend when it comes to market, especially with the Landry light. And last week we take a look, we take the look, we took a look at the weekly. And if you take a look at the Landry light, meaning lows are greater than the moving average, you can see good things or mostly good things happen when you're above the moving average. Based on Landry light, bad things happen when you're below and so on and so forth. So the 50, I'm sorry, the 30 week EMA, I just started playing with it last week. I know you wanna party with me, but it looks like it does show some promise and maybe a 50 week moving average would be just as good. I mean, that's what we've been using with the system and all, but this is kind of interesting. Now we'll catch up a little bit. So maybe that lag can actually help you by not letting you whipsaw in and out. So that's something to kind of think about too. But again, mostly green, mostly good things. I should put mostly by these things. And I think the whole point that Guide and Baleo were making is that when the market's in weak mode, it could beget more weak, weakness. And that's where you gotta be careful. Something that's, also kind of fascinating. I know you want to party with me. I was looking at one of my old presentations. I was going to do like another one of those surviving and prospering during a bear market presentations, but I realized I've kind of beat the dead horse on that quite a bit. And a lot of the stuff has already happened. Obviously, we've already sold off hard. You know, the bomb's already blown up. But in, luckily, last time I did one earlier this year, things were just beginning to come unglued a little bit. Anyway, so I was going to do a presentation on that, but what I'd recommend you do is just go in and watch that surviving and prospering during a bear market. And I'll, it might take me a couple of days, but I'll get some links put uh, down below on the YouTube. So if you take a look at the weekly bow tie proper order, proper order means the 10 simple is above the 30. I'm sorry, the 20 exponential and the 20 exponential is above the 30. So 10 above 20, 20 above 30. The 10 is simple and the 20 and 30 exponential for the bow ties. If I don't say that, I'm going to get asked. I know everybody here is rolling their eyes like, come on, Dave. <laughs> anyway, proper order can really help you out. So if the 10 gets below the 20 and the 20 gets below the 30, you got to be careful, especially on a weekly basis. Now, we did get whipsawed if you were following that during the pandemic, but we had plenty of other signals that fired off, including a TFM 10% system, cell system signal, that is right before the pandemic began in earnest. And that actually triggered before a daily bow tie went to downtrend proper order. So that was pretty cool. But as you can see, it was a little sloppy in the changeover. When you see it go from green straight to red, that's an abrupt changeover. And that's what a bow tie like the hokey pokey is all about. That means that you've got a pretty serious rollover intact. As you know, we had a little bit of a throwback here, make everybody feel pretty good. And then of course, then the market rolls over. Kind of the most pain situation, what's gonna cause the most pain to most amount of people, that's what the market's gonna do. Anyway, you can see, again, it took a while to roll over, but it did roll over. And we are in and remain in downtrend proper order. The 10 tried to get back above the 20, but then it, as you can see, it's rolled back over. So we're still in downtrend proper order. Longer term, as I have preached ad nauseum to the point where people are like, we're sick of seeing these charts. But it, it does help to look at them again every now and then. And that, that signal there, you can see, was kind of late during the pandemic, which is fine. Again, we, we do look at more than one thing, including eyeballing the charts, of course. But you can see mostly red or downtrend proper order, mostly green or uptrend proper order. The market tends to do good things. And when you have red, it tends to do bad things. So where I'm going with all this is simple metrics can really help you stay on the right side of the market. And you just have to be a little detached when you're looking at them. And obviously the market often goes the wrong way, but if you're, you have some sort of metrics, some sort of trend qualifiers in place, bow tie proper order, Landry light for various moving averages, 
bow ties, obviously 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential, but the Landry light on the 50 simple in various time frames, and the 30 exponential as we're now experimenting with in various time frames. So just it always amazes me, not that these things are perfect, but they can do a really good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. Some random thoughts, and some of these are left over. Most of them are left over. I did add to them a little bit. Some is better than none. And just by accident, I saw Greg had republished his article he did a while back on moving averages, and I published it in, or published a link, I should say, posted the link in my Facebook group on that. And one thing he talked about is, is a lot of their averages that they're using to explain how the market always goes up and part of the Kool-Aid they drink and they, they adhere to is based on an 81-year time horizon. And I'm always shocked at how these guys can have careers, but I guess if you hit it just right and the market mostly goes up for 30 years, then you're in, you're out, and you're done, and then maybe you miss the next bear market or whatever. But in my, I guess, almost 30 years of doing this, I've already seen two bear markets, or I guess three, and this will be my fourth. So they're a lot more common than you think they are. And, you know, something interesting, and I'm just kind of thinking, this is why I love teaching, is thinking out loud, is are we seeing more bear, bear markets now because everything is, is sped up? We're li we live in this microwave society than we've seen in the past. And I think that could be some fodder for research. So some market timing is better than none, again, unless you have an 81-year time horizon. It doesn't have to be rocket science, something with the moron in its name. It could do quite well. The Zionist intent for the trend following moron system, as you know, is to avoid those big diaper change moments. It's not to try to beat the pants off the market. As I preach, market timing is less about beating the market and more about not letting the market beat you. So what if buy and hold beats the pants off of you every now and then, longer term, you're gonna win when that market drops 30%, 40%, 50%, and sometimes even more. Think in terms of performance-based investing, these people I was talking about over the weekend who were kind enough, generous enough to take us a Saints game, they both own their own businesses. And so I tried to talk to them like, okay, you've got the, the same argument I always use. You've got four employees that are working hard, the fifth one's just sitting on his butt. So four busting their butt and one sitting on his butt, who are you to get rid of? And it's like, well, come on, Dave, you know, don't be so stupid. But in the markets, they're like, well, the market's down, we should buy more. It's like, no. <laughs> uh, stuff can take a long time to come back, sometimes more than 25 years. And I've had people argue my face on that one and I don't even bother arguing anymore. I just, if it's, we're at a cocktail party, I just go grab a beer or whatever. <laughs> but I would tell you, if you're doing the technical analysis apologetics, which I've been kind of getting into lately, I know you guys want to party with me, right? <laughs> but tell them to go look at the charts and see that it takes 25 years to come back and, and show them maybe 2007, 2008, when the market hit 13 year lows. So that's pretty tough. You put a bunch of money in and 13 years later, the market's lower than it was when you got started. So that's not a good thing, obviously. And the other thing too, the diaper change, both mentally and monetarily, and I've witnessed a lot of people get hurt badly during the pandemic and, and, and prior bear markets. And some of these same people, uh, they're getting hurt again and, and they're not, I don't know why they're not talking to me. I don't, I don't understand why. And then as normally happens, a psychologist will probably chime in and, uh, or a psychiatrist like last time and send me a long email explaining to me why these people do what they do. I don't understand it though. Now, one thing I was noticing, you know, one thing that's great about having the Facebook group now is I get to see what everybody's doing because we talk about it. And we could kind of noodle with a lot of things. And I noticed one of you guys, based on the market weakness, was done and, and pulled all his, his positions. And I would argue that you see each position to its 
fruition. And sometimes you're going to say, damn it, I wish I'd have gotten out of everything. But every now and then you're going to have one take off. And that one might have saved your ass. And obviously this one that I'm going to talk about now is ARLP. So we take a look at the market going back to the first of the year. And there's been some gyrations obviously in between. But if you connect the, the close at the, at the beginning of the year to the close of today and draw an arrow, it's it's down yes this is being recorded i'm not sure when it's going to post on facebook but it is being recorded and this one might have to go up completely unedited so i gotta watch what i say i guess <laughs> anyway if you take a look at arlp now obviously lately it hasn't been that excited uh, thanks for asking son it um sun um but you can see it's going down a little bit, but for most of the year, it's going higher. And the last time I checked, it was up like 70 something percent for the year. Now, if you go back to the beginning of the year, I did a presenta presentation on seeing each position to its fruition. And you'll notice that we got stopped out of a couple of longs that we were in and they kind of failed miserably, but we got out of the way and we're relatively unscathed, a little bit of a loss here and there. And had we bailed on this one position, we'd be in far worse shape than we are now. So I would recommend you see each position to its fruition. You've got a stop in place, in for a penny, in for a pound. Don't be obstinate, honor that stop, okay? But ride them out. You never know what's gonna happen. Like right now, we've got a little biotech. I think it's a biotech. And it might take off, okay? And we've got another company in there that's um, relatively new IPO. and it's kind of flirting around with getting kind of close to the stop, but who knows, it, it might take off and those one or two stocks might make our year. Now, I don't wanna make it sound too elusive, but like the hokey pokey, that's what momentum trading is all about, catching those occasional outliers like this. And this can make all the difference in the world, especially longer term in a portfolio. All right, I know we covered a lot of the same ground and I know what kind of quickly through it. If Anything strikes a chord with you here, I would encourage you to check my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Dave Landry. Of course, check my website, and I'd love for you to become a member of the website. If you become a gold member, you have access to the Facebook group where you can interact with other traders, and I love it, and I get a lot of good stuff out of the group, and I learn a lot from the group, and, and I get a lot of fodder for these shows and fodder for research. and sometimes just some great setups especially when the ipo market is hot but lately it hasn't been too hot also the ogre trading the opening gap reversal trading i haven't seen any lately but i'm looking every day and if i find some that are kind of textbook in nature i'll throw them out in facebook which i haven't done lately because there haven't been any but by the way that's one thing i you know every night i'm thinking i'm going to talk about uh patience tonight <laughs> you know but it is important for you to be patient and wait for setups and wait for the market to improve. And really, trading is a, is a whole lot of of waiting. All right, let's shift gears. Let's go to crypto. Now, I was looking at crypto earlier because of this presentation. Now, last week I said, a week before, and it struck a chord with one of you guys. I don't know if Gio's here tonight, but he said that was one of his take, good takeaways was you have to look at markets even when they don't seem like they're worth looking at. And I'll give you a case in point, and this is this poor guy thinks I'm always picking on him. <laughs> There's been a few, but I had one guy say, hey, Dave, I'm gonna stay with your service, but I'm gonna take a couple of weeks off and because there's nothing worthwhile doing in this market and I don't see any setups coming soon. And, and that night I found two setups. Now, hopefully he didn't start his little sabbatical early, but he missed two of the biggest setups of the year. And I'm not rubbing salt so much in his wounds as this has happened throughout history, which makes me think whenever I start getting those emails, I probably should post them in uh, Facebook and say, hey guys, we're getting close. But anyway, being forced to do a little crypto analysis tonight, I stumbled across this one. And I was going to show it as an example of, hey, 
when the market is blowing and going like it was last fall, all you had to do was come in here and sort them by percent change. And we'll take a look at a few of them and just buy the strongest ones. And what I did back then was I'd flip them out just to keep the math easy. I would flip out half at 20% higher and trail the stop on the remainder. And I just got a little antsy and couldn't stand myself. So I went ahead, couldn't stand it. So I went ahead and picked up a little bit, a token position here just for S&Gs. Um, not a whole lot of them are headed higher. So I wouldn't encourage you to go in and do that relative strength trading. But in general, if you're going to do relative strength trading, you just sort by percentage change. And then you just take a look at these and then something like this one that's kind of going straight up, you just hop on. It can be a little scary. And I don't know whether I'm going to make money on this trade or not, but I can tell you if everything is going up in, in, in mass, you could print money with this relative strength trading. But it, there's a lot of ifs in, in that sentence. As I said, ad nauseum of one client would just take my Landry list, which is a list of stocks I publish daily in my trading service, and he used the CNBC app and he would just buy the top ones in the list all day long. He would just, on his, his little phone trader, in between his appointments, he would he would just make sure he would see what stocks were the hottest, make sure he was in those. And if something dropped, let's say to slot three or four, however many slots he was looking at, he would just get rid of that one and then buy the, the next one up. That works. That works incredibly well, but you've got to be in the market for it. And all those down arrows I just drew in the market should tell you that, hey, we're not in that kind of market so something like this breaking out the brand new highs again if we were if everything was blowing and going will be worthwhile so not a whole lot to do in crypto but it is trying to wake up again but it's been trying to wake up for a long long time so let's just take a look at bitcoin real quick and maybe ethereum and then we'll pop out to the overall market here's ethereum not doing so hot okay you can see lots of landry light below not to confuse the issue with facts, but I'm wondering how the proof of stake model is going to work. I try not to study these things too much, but back when I was really kind of crazy about crypto, I read a lot of articles that kind of poo pooed the proof of stake model as opposed to proof of work. Proof of stake just means that if you own some of it, you get to participate in sort of a I guess it's like a raffle for who gets to to confirm transactions as opposed to everybody's just competing with a bunch of computers. So proof of, proof of work, I think, is a better model. They're going to proof of stake with Ethereum. So if somebody has millions and millions and millions of dollars in Ethereum, they have a bit of an unfair advantage. Anyway, let's take a look at Bitcoin real quick. Bitcoin's been bottoming out forever. <laughs> I would not buy it. I was, I'm going to be on a bull bear debate here soon for stock charts. And I said I want the bear side on Bitcoin. So I wouldn't rush out and buy it, but it is finding, it keeps finding support down here in the 18,000 or so level. But I would not buy it just because it's down at those low levels. I would wait for quite a bit of upside Landry light before getting too excited. And that Landry light is really your best friend. In fact, we could do this real quick. Wow, that worked. That was cool. First time it's ever worked. <laughs> so let's put Bitcoin in here real quick. And I'm getting ready to jump into stocks. If you guys want to ask about individual stocks, I know we talk about stocks in the group, and there's really not a whole lot of stocks to talk about. Yeah, I like that one, George. We'll talk about that. I don't know if that one's in the Landry list. It it it, <clears throat> it might be, but we could talk about it. That's fine. So just taking a look at the Landry light and Bitcoin. What do we learn tonight? What do I preach at nauseum? Green, good, okay? Tarzan speak, red, bad, okay? Green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red. Center in your hands, okay? Lots of red, short or don't buy it, okay? 
green, red, green, red. If you can't get going, draw you a little range in here, like right here. You can see if you can't get going, leave it alone. Draw your sideways arrows. Okay, we're back to the red again. Okay, all right, let's shift gears and get to the telechart. Yeah, Bitcoin is the same problem as gold. Uh, the dollar trend is good, and and you know maybe the Fed is maybe in part helping that dollar along with all those huge interest rate hikes. I put a chart out, I borrowed it from somebody. I don't know who posted. I think it was one of my Italian brethren, and I'm friends with a lot of Italians on Facebook through my business dealings over there. And they, they put a lot of good stuff up. But anyway, I grabbed the chart and it's one of the quickest climbs in the history of the Fed as far as interest rate hikes. And and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's good that they're getting ahead of it and they're being very, what's the word? Is the word hawkish when they do that or whatever, but prudent. Not that I want higher rates and all the other mess, but they're trying to get the inflation under control. Great analysis, what's your favorite platform? Stock charts. Stock charts is becoming more and more one of my favorites because I'm just learning how to do a lot. I use a lot of tools, as I've said in many uh, presentations before. TC is really quick and dirty. So I think that over time, maybe I can learn to do some of the stuff that I do in TC, but I'm a little slow to change. I'm just do, I'm doing more things in stock charts like the ACP and and all that with my plugin over there and a lot of research there. Uh, Metastock is is something I do a lot of R and D with, and right now Telechart helps me really bang out a lot of charts quickly. If you look on my website, and in the middle of the home page, there's a a big box. And if you take a look at that, uh, there's a lot of resources under there that I would recommend you take a look at. And let me just show you that real quick. Is it still showing? Yeah, it's still showing. So right here, if that's, oh, no, no, we didn't, okay. So right here, if you click on this, you'll find the resources that I find valuable and a list of things I'd recommend you do. And you can also get the layman's guide to trading stocks on this page. So that's daylearner.com slash getting dash started, or just an easier way of getting there is the big old block on my homepage. I've got this big old block here. Nobody ever clicks on it <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the uh, charts. You're welcome, Paul. Anytime, man. But yeah, I like the quick and dirty of uh, telechart. In fact, I like the old version until one day it didn't work. You know, I don't know if that was by purpose or, or whatever. And it was forced me to go to the new version. And that was like 20 years later, right? <laughs> anyway, take a look at S&P 500. Uh, obviously, downtrend so far intact. Fairly persistent downtrend, as you can see. It does have a bit of a head and shoulders bottom look to it. As I preach... I prefer bottoms at bottoms as opposed to bottoms at tops because we're still pretty high up here if you think about it longer term. And the other thing too, and, and, and I hope I wasn't confusing my clients by saying it's, it's got a head and shoulder look to it. Keep in mind that big picture technical analysis, these patterns might take months to develop. I'm just kind of looking at it. Well, if we undercut this prior shoulder here, okay, and if we don't take out this low, then, you know, lots of ifs in that sentence, right? Then we might have a bit of a head and shoulders bottom. And again, I prefer a bottoming pattern like way down here somewhere at multi, multi-year lows as opposed to right around here where we're still at fairly high levels. But anyway, P is not looking so hot, obviously. Downside, Landry Light, all those good, good things we talked about. Bonds, same sort of thing. Look at the persistency in bonds. Persistency just means it tends to go down one day after the next and mathematically that's linear regression and, and i've done that before in the old tele charts i had the sometimes i put like 20 or 30 of linear regressions on the chart and here's another nerdy thing that's kind of fun to do i know you want to party with me right 
but you put 20 or 30 of those in different colors for different time frames and you kind of move the charts back and forth and it helps you to find that persistency and the trends but you could also save yourself a lot of time and hassle and complication and just draw a trend line and try to intersect as many bars as possible this is a persistent downtrend persistency is one of the most valuable things when it comes to market it means that there's just this persistent and relentless selling day after day after day after day in general i mean obviously the market bounces a little bit here and there but when you have a lot of persistency it just keeps going down so john was saying earlier he said the problem with bitcoin and gold i'm sorry it's craig is uh us dollar trend good in tarzan speak yeah look at the dollar and you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to see which way that's headed, so far at least. It's pretty amazing. You would think with the printing presses running, printing presses running like they are, that the dollar wouldn't be doing so, so good. But as one of you guys pointed out, and rightfully so, the, the UUP is a basket based against other currencies. Doesn't mean that the dollar isn't losing its purchasing value. I mean, my the whipped cream I like for my coffee is like nine bucks, you know? and I was in the store the other day. My wife put the generic brand in the cart, and I'm like, "What's up with that?" You know, and she's like, "Well, that stuff is nine bucks." I'm like, "I see you got your wine." <laughs> anyway, you can see nice uptrend in the dollar, still intact. And that's putting the pressure on Bitcoin, probably. I tell you, I'm really bummed with Bitcoin. I have a little bit huddled. I hate to admit that, but I do just to experiment with the hardware wallet, as I admitted in the past. But the disappointment of Bitcoin is it was supposed to be our salvation because there's only 21 million and there's I know there's paper Bitcoin out there. And I meant to do an article on that years ago, never got around to doing it. But basically, it's a lot of paper Bitcoin out there, stuff that's they're just creating it out of the ether, you know. <laughs> and like GBTC, do they really have all the Bitcoin? I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know that they claim they do. But yeah, the dollar's putting the hurting on them, and, and you know these gold. I love what Larry Williams said a while back. He was talking about gold, and <laughs> he said the guys on TV are always pumping gold, but boy, they sure do want your dollars for the gold. And I was listening to a little talk radio today, I believe the house, one of those rare times. And you know, it seems like all these hosts now they shill gold, and they make it sound like it's part of their presentation. We obviously don't realize you're being sold. And they were talking about how great gold is. And it's like, <laughs> you know, I was thinking, no, you don't, Danny. It's like, look at it. Just, it's gone down, right? I mean, come on, guys. You don't have to be a rocket surgeon to see that. NASDAQ Composites, kind of an ugly day today, obviously. All these indices are super duper oversold over the very short term and over the intermediate term. But again, sometimes it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. And I've been burning a little bit trying to capture some of these bounces in here and I've caught a couple, but sometimes it just keeps dropping rallies just enough to get you excited and then turn turns back down. So be a trend probably more on even intraday. Take a look at the Rusty. Rusty imploded today. Look at that down 2% and a quarter. So that's damn ugly. Okay. And hopefully these lows will hold in here and even if we do bounce, don't get too excited because it could just be a dead cat bounce. Please don't email me. <laughs> it's an old Wall Street term. I heard they're getting rid of um, a bunch of these things. Anyway, I digress. Energy's chopping around in here. Relative strength bases, they're much stronger than the rest, but I wouldn't buy them unless you're a fund manager and you have to just kind of lose the least amount of money <laughs> then by all means you know make sure your long energies and whatever else is strong at the moment which is not much you may get kind of a bottom it took 13 years of essentially negative rates to get inflation how long would it take to eliminate it i hate to be a debbie downer you may get that kind of bottom it took 13 years so craig are you saying we might get a bottom or we might not get a bottom i don't know i mean that's you know, I had a friend many years ago, and he was too close to it. He was running a hedge fund, and his hedge fund was was foreign currencies, forex. And I'm not sure what it 
whether he's still doing that or not, but he kind of like packed up everything and sold everything. It was kind of a, almost like a bit of a nomad for a while. And I don't know where he landed. And uh, he passed through my town and spent the night with us on his journey. And he just saw the whole world kind of coming unglued. Well, it took a lot longer. He was right, but early, maybe by 15 years, you know, or 10 years at least. So God, I hope it's not all coming home to roost. Chickens are coming home to roost. Which I had chickens in the country. That was cool. They would they would come home to roost. And a little solar door. It was cool. My throat would get sore though. You know. Paul says, I love your perspective. Well, I love you being a client, Paul. So thank you. So that's a that makes me feel especially good. Since you're paying me and thanking me. Consumer not durables, that's a bit of a bummer, you know, because there's a lot of things here you still have to do in the bear market, and there's no flight to safety here. And, you know, no flight to safety in gold. So that's that's a little concerning, too. I know the dollars, as Craig pointed out, which was pretty smart, is probably what's hurting gold, because gold and other commodities are dollar denominated, like TLT in the 80s. We'll have to look at that. I'll look at that. Financials kind of look like the little bit worse. I, I've been saying the financials look like stocks, bases of peas, but financials actually look a little worse. As you can see, they're getting pretty close to those June, July lows. Biotechnology was one of the stronger areas on a relative strength basis. And this is a good example why you don't want to rush out and trade relative strength in a bear market. Because, yeah, you might outperform other stocks, but a net negative overall performance is still a net negative. Anyway, I don't need to go through all these, but obviously a lot of areas like transports bust into brand new lows. That's not a good thing, obviously. Software, brand new lows today, taking out the prior lows. That's pretty ugly. Semiconductors, they close down here at multi-year lows. So one thing that I often tell everybody, and I learned this many, many years ago, is a closing low and a closing high is something you want to pay attention to. And that's something that, and that's where some of my IPO patterns, that was kind of the genesis for that. Okay, individual stocks, go ahead and shift gears. We might get a much lower bottom. In stocks or in bonds or both? Yeah, ARQQ has been catching my eye. It has a ton of overhead supply. The volume was pretty light today at 139. I don't use volume as a predictor, but I use it to see if it's thick enough to trade. It does have some overhead supply, but you know, if you get in at six bucks and you ride to 12 and it starts getting in trouble. So this one looks okay. Um, I don't remember if I put it on a laundry list or not. It's not one of those setups that looks so great that I'm going to be like, oh, man, I can't believe you mentioned a stock in a laundry list. <laughs> I know you can't get a little pregnant. I, I get it. Craig says both. Yeah, you know, they both had it lower for now, for sure. All right, ENTB. ENTB as a long. What? E E T like ET phone home, EB. Yeah, this one's, this one's okay. Uh, it's caught my eye here and there. Nice little gap higher. It's got decent volume, so it's tradable. So yeah, I like that. It's a it's a bit of an extreme gap. And sometimes when you get these extreme gaps, I mean, that's almost 100% or 70% gap. Sometimes it's like one and done, big gap higher and they implode. But you could certainly do much worse. So maybe if it begins to take off again, it might be worth a shot. So Stuart, that's, that's not, I'll give you a not bad on that one. But yeah, that one's been catching my mind, my, my, my eye quite a bit. ADTN as a short yeah my only problem here well it's okay it's kind of wide and loose it's got okay volume i'll give it an okay but yeah it's pretty much imploded it's pulled back a little bit um it's just so damn bumpy i would be careful there but yeah i hear you Stuart, and it's definitely in trouble and you know i'm proud of you guys you know <laughs> people used to show me charts like this and say you i want to buy that i'm like why yeah, these shipping stocks, I've been watching them. They're extended. That's the only problem. Shippers can be a real pain in the butt. When they go, they go like crazy. Shippers don't really trend well longer term. I found that out when I did a lot of longer term trend following analysis. But yeah, it looks okay. 
John, I'd let it pull back further though. This thing has had, been on quite a tear. I would let it pull back, what's that, uh, 80, 90% higher. I'd let it pull back much more deeply, but that, yeah, it's been on my list and some of the other shippers, but those shippers have really gone straight up lately. Okay, anything else? Well, while we're in impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Oh, here we go, one more. For those who have money sitting around looking for a return of some kind, six month CDs through TD are yielding yielding 3.9. Wow, you know, it's been so long since there's been any interest rates to speak of anywhere. I haven't really thought about chasing yield. And as I said before, there's people out there who chase yield and it's like, eh you know, a 0 0.001 or a 0 0.0015, and it just doesn't seem like it's worth the trouble. But that's interesting. Good point. Good point. So, yeah, 3.9%. You got some? <laughs> yeah, you know, it would be, it's stressful, though. I mean, you know, my whipping cream is twice as much as it used to be. Uh, so it, it, some of the things that I like a lot, the inflation is 100%. So you're making 4% on your money. I guess that's better than a poke in the eye. But yeah, I hear you correct. Thanks for pointing that out though. Seriously, all, all kidding aside. All right, thanks everyone. I appreciate you taking down busy, out of your busy schedule. I'll check in briefly tomorrow, but I do have to be out of the office. So you might not see me too much uh, in Facebook tomorrow and elsewhere. But everybody have a great weekend and then hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls. Ooh, no, next week I will do a show, maybe. <laughs> we'll talk about that next week. All right, thanks again, and uh, you're welcome, George. And may the trend be with you. You too, sir. Thank you.